Very good, if you will. We are back on board. We uh, are taking advantage of this morning session. We've taken a look at macroeconomics. We've seen how the union advances uh, towards a better future. We're beginning, please. Kindly take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. What we're going to look at now and study now are issues that are more concrete, more sectorial. We're going to see what the impact is of these measures, this redesign by the Union of Events. And we have another very interesting group, experts in the field. David Wright, who is Secretary General of the International Organization of Securities Commissions, IOSCO. Also with us, Gabriel Silas Brugge, who was with the University of Manchester, visiting school, political science, Copenhagen University. Jean-Louis Martin, who researches macroeconomics at Credit Agricole. And Miguel Otero, who is an economist and a researcher at the Real Instituto Elcano. So as I said, we're going to look into the details of some specifics as to how redesign affects the union. And let's begin with David and the financials. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to the Foundation Carlos de Amberes, Charles of Antwerp, for having invited me to participate in this very uh, interesting panel. I've lived um, in Belgium for 35 years, uh, in, in Flanders, actually. I am delighted to collaborate with the Foundation, and I congratulate the Foundation for their excellent activities uh, on behalf of uh, Europe and its culture. And congratulations also for opening this outstanding museum of Flemish art. The more we can actually see countries and cultures, the more they grow, the better for Europe and the better for the world. Allow me to quote Jean Monnet when he said that what would he do if he were to build uh, Europe anew? And Jean Monnet said, well, I would begin by looking at culture. I think that that is a very important message indeed. And if you uh, allow me, I'm going to continue my address in English, which is my uh, mother tongue. Care slowly and carefully so um, everybody can understand my personal remarks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a, a rare species these days, which is a, a British European. Uh, there are not many of us uh, left. Um, uh, I do believe uh, in international cooperation. Uh, I am a multilateralist. The more global cooperation we have in the world, uh, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, global cooperation builds friendships, it builds institutions, uh, and it minimizes the dangers of war and worse. Uh, I absolutely do not like uh, chacun pour soi bilateralism. Uh, I believe that uh, the more we work together uh, and share sovereignty in a world that we live in, the better. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes this debate in Europe, uh, especially the British debate, is what people always talk about giving up sovereignty. Uh, we don't give up sovereignty, we share it. <coughs> we share it in, uh, in decision-making structures established by treaties. Uh, and it really is extraordinary sometimes that the British, anyway, forget that they share sovereignty as well in NATO. Uh, but somehow doing it in the economic and social spheres seems to be uh, so difficult. We have all the forces in the world which are moving us together, the forces of technology, the forces of trade, the forces of finance, environment, health. Look at the recent Ebola outbreak, how dangerous that could have been for the whole world. Uh, and all these arguments push us together and, in my view, require us uh, and require governments, institutions uh, uh, to build. Uh, and that is what uh, I want to talk about. I believe that uh, the European Union has a major role to lead these debates at the global level. Uh, and I want to give you some examples where it is and where it is not. Uh, and um, uh, I fear today that we're just not strong enough at the global level 
which is something that worries me. Let me start first of all by saying, and I very much agree with what Guillermo has said before, uh, Europe cannot be strong on the global level if it is weak internally, whether it's institutional or political, and particularly economic. Uh, the countries of Asia often uh, reason in terms of size and growth and are you the biggest. Uh, well, we all know the problems today uh, in the European Union. Uh, we simply have to stabilize the economic situation. We have to grow, and if we don't grow, we're going to see a proliferation of political extremism, and I think we're all aware uh, of the dangers or possible dangers uh, of that. Uh, we have to simplify and de-bureaucratize Europe. Europe is full of useless bureaucracy, which is extremely expensive, and which actually hinders the wealth creation process. Uh, it shouldn't cost, frankly speaking, 3,000 euros in this country to set up an enterprise. I think that's ridiculous. It should cost virtually nothing. Hmm? We should be encouraging entrepreneurs, making their lives simple uh, in order to create uh, wealth. We also need to uh, uh, pluralize finance. Uh, and by that I mean we need to have different ways of financing different parts of the economy, not just the banking system, which is Europe's main source of financing, but all the other different instruments of global finance, which is venture capital, bond markets, equity markets, all sorts of new techniques, crowdfunding, and why don't we have a European Alibaba? Why don't we connect our enterprises together and get them to trade and provide uh, credit? So we must, absolutely must, uh, in, in ensure that we can grow and provide prosperity for our people. A final comment, if I may, about the Euro. You know, the biggest beneficiary of the euro, without any doubt, uh, is Germany. Hmm? Uh, Germany uh, has, with the euro, an exchange rate that makes its exports extremely competitive around the world, uh, and the cost of debt, uh, its debt, extremely low. Sometimes we forget that, hmm? and I think it should be very prominent in these difficult debates about stabilizing uh, the euro. My second point. I think a very good example of what not to do at the European level is to proceed on bilateral trade agreements. So I am absolutely not in favour at all of bilateral, uh, the bilateral TIPP negotiations with the United States. Nothing to do with the United States. But actually what this does is two things. First of all, it weakens the multilateral trading system. The WTO is no longer in town. And yet that WTO has a very precious instrument, which is called a dispute settlement system, a system that was set up by the <coughs> recently deceased Sir Leon Britton with his counterpart in the United States, Mickey Cantor, in the multilateral trade negotiations of the Uruguay Round. And that mechanism actually has stopped the worst forms of protectionism. We should put all that energy that's going into bilateral agreements to make the multilateral system work. Bilateral agreements are distortionary. Don't let anybody think that they're not. They are, <coughs> and they're discriminatory. Uh, and if they weren't, why aren't we doing bilateral trade agreements uh, with Malawi, Congo, and other African countries? That's not even on the agenda. This is about power, uh, and I think it's the wrong way to approach international trade. So Europe goes towards the United States with this bilateral agreement. What's the signal we're giving to Latin America? What's the signal we're giving to Asia or Africa? Uh, I think it's a bad political move. Uh, and, and also, I think that somehow there's this view that an EU-US bilateral agreement will somehow be projected and become the model for everybody else. Well, I can tell you in my travels around the world, in my job, there is no way, no way, India, China, and a lot of other countries, emerging countries, strong emerging countries, are just going to take a piece of paper negotiated by the EU and the US and say, we're signing up to that, forget it. And I think, again, this is another reason uh, why uh, this agreement is the wrong way to go, 
put the effort into the multilateral system. And then we have this extraordinary dispute settlement system whereby individuals can sue governments for the non-application of these rules, but they can't, you know, there's no mechanism for dealing with each other's disputes. Uh, I find it extraordinary, and I hope the European Commission will go in a different direction. The third thing I, I want to say is that I believe that uh, the European Union has to become much stronger in the multilateral organizations, and that means speaking with one voice, difficult though that is. I see too many examples where uh, European member states show up, uh, a representative of the European institutions show up, and they just might as well be in different uh, parts uh, of the negotiation. <coughs> Sometimes I see uh, uh, the United Kingdom lining up entirely with a view from the United States, and the other member states on a completely different line, or else uh, other, other constellations. So if Europe wants to be strong on the international stage, it's got to have a unified voice. If it wants to be strong in helping to resolve the problems in the Middle East, it's got to have a unified position, and not a fragmented position uh, that we see too often. Now, uh, in, the, in the finance area, which is where I come from, uh, what do we have? Well, we have institutions called the G20, the Financial Stability Board, uh, standard setters such as my organization, and we do the securities part of all of this, uh, Basel committees uh, and all sorts. Uh, what is the characteristic of this? Well, the characteristic is this is a, a mutual best efforts policy. Uh, nothing we do here is binding in any legal <coughs> sense uh, whatsoever. So if a country does not want to apply uh, a standard. If a country does not apply the capital rules correctly, there's nothing anybody can do about it uh, because there is no dispute settlement system. There is no law. In the European Union, we can take a member state to the European Court if it doesn't apply uh, the rules correctly, internal market rules correctly or whatever. You can't do that at international level. Uh, and by not being able to do that, you have here a system that is, in my view, extremely fragile. Now, already we see different interpretations of standards. Uh, what we see is cross-border conflicts of laws and no mechanisms to reduce it. And here's the bad news. The situation is going to get worse. Not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. Why is it going to get worse? Because today, finance, global finance, is still dominated by the EU and the US. But it won't be in 20 years' time. Uh, there's a huge number of big emerging markets coming through with big capital markets. So if it's all going to be done bilateral, you're going to have a matrix here of incredible complexity of everybody interpreting the rules the way they want uh, and, uh, and bilateral disputes uh, evolving as a result. There are two options here. The best option is to move towards an international treaty, which is my multilateral inter international hat. Uh, the more likely option is to really start to build ex-ante cooperation uh, between member states who are participating in these processes on a much more uh, effective, effective basis. Let me finally say that um, I believe that, uh, that Europe has to speak one, with one voice, determine its priorities, and yes, sell its model. The European Union is a magnificent model of cooperation, and I don't want to hear any arguments about the fact that this is the cheapest deal on the supermarket shelf. 1%, as Guillermo was saying, 1% of GDP for largely peace in Europe, not on all of our borders, we know the trouble, but within the European Union, this is an amazing, amazing achievement. Let's sell our model. Let's encourage people to come to Europe. Do what the US did, which was the, open up its university system for people all over the world. Uh, so I don't think we should be shy about Europe. We should be strong about Europe. Build, uh, build our, our competences together. Sit down, work it out, and lead. That's what we need to do, lead. Thank you. Muchas gracias, David. Well, thank you very much, David. You said that British Europe, pro-Europe people, there's less and less people in Britain that are for Europe, but it's uh, curious how uh, 
some British people also defend the project, uh, the European project, better than anybody else in the same way that many British people are the best experts on Spain, for instance. From what you've said, I've got a comment and a question. Comment is, in fact, the bureaucracy, you've said, European bureaucracy is useless and inefficient. And uh, uh, that's a lot of criticism about the legitimacy of the union is based on that. The tremendous cost of all this red tape, Brussels, bureaucracy, this huge super state. Um, but I wonder where are the incentives to change when the institutions themselves, the governments, are, should be doing it. But are they perhaps not interested in doing it? Uh, that's, that's one comment. But the question has to do with multilateralism and your... Uh, idea of having an international treaty that can help us towards managing international trade. Um, the European Union for many years has been stuck. I'm just going to mention two points. The Mercosur agreement, agreement with Mercosur and their agreement with Cuba, which is being negotiated again because the, the Americans once again are going to take the step, are going to take the lead uh, as regards Cuba. An international treaty requires... Tremendous effort, tremendous consensus and, and, trem and a tremendous amount of time. Are we, do we have all that? Do we have that time, that will? Uh, can we do it? I mean, look, um, if I look at the world today and let's just look at the Middle East, hmm? let's take that. Uh, you know, the only model that's going to work hmm, is a model of cooperation, respect, uh, sitting down, actually, no, no, no government's going to sort this out for this. They have to sort it out themselves, and I've said that. And uh, you have to build institutions. I think Jean Monnet was absolutely right. Uh, institutions are essential. I believe in institutions. Now, there are a lot of governments that don't believe that at the global level. But if you don't have institutions, uh, you have no implementation of law. You have no method of ensuring the rules are applied. And that's one of the problems we have uh, in finance today. We can have all sorts of colored diagrams and, and, uh, uh, and very nice pictures, but we can't enforce the standards. Uh, and I just don't think that Europe could not work without institutions. Hmm? The, court, the, Euro the European Court of Justice, the European Commission, the genius of the founding fathers of Europe, to give the powers of proposal to the Commission. I think it's a pity that this is getting eroded. And I talked to Jean Monnet's old head of cabinet, a very old man a few years ago, and I asked him, I said, what would Jean Monnet have thought of Europe today? And he immediately said that one thing he would not have liked is the European Council determining uh, in, in its own way the agenda of Europe. So look, we can argue till the cows come home here, but in the end, my view is that the world is a safer place with institutions and cooperation and multilateralism, and not everybody going their own ways and sort of cooperating on an ad hoc basis. That just will never work. And all the forces are pushing us there. Let's realize that. Gracias. Vamos a continuar con Thank you. Um, we're going to continue with the role of the Union, the European Union and Trade, and uh, the treaty that you were mentioning, the relations between Europe and the US. Good. Thank you. Thank you to the Foundation for inviting me and to Christina for chairing this. I am going to turn the issue round. I'm going to talk about the implications in economic terms of the global European policy. And also, I'm going to give you a few thoughts on the TTIP, the uh, agreement between Europe and the US, and uh, uh, what's going to happen as regards that uh, internationally. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on that transatlantic treatment, a treaty which is being negotiated this week between the US and the uh, and Europe, a free trade tre uh, treaty which is known as TTIP, which in English means Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, TTIP, TTIP. Uh, it's a project that uh, is tremendously important politically, politically, although it hasn't been debated in Spain. It's one of the priorities, uh, from my point of view, the only 
more proactive priority of the European Commission or the reforms to a certain extent of the Eurozone are a bit reactive in the face of the crisis. This is not reactive, it's more proactive, which is being um, actively promoted. And we heard Mark Rosconi this morning talk about the contribution of the TTIP to growth and employment in Europe. Um, the defenders of the TTIP, <coughs> there's opposition to TTIP, uh, from citizens, but uh, the defenders of the project have said that the TTIP is going to contribute, is going to be stimulate the economy in times of recession, that it's not going to cost a cent. Barroso tells us it's not going to cost a single cent. It's free. Uh, and um, secondly, the TTIP is going to allow Europe and the US to continue leading uh, governance economically at world level. Those are the two arguments that are presented by the defenders of the TTIP. And I am going to criticise those two arguments. I am one of those who are few people, few, uh, there are not many academics but that criticise the TTIP. Most people are in favour, but I'm not. I'm not against because I'm against international cooperation. No, I am all for international cooperation. But I think that these two arguments that we're told we're given are problematic. And I'm going to address them in my talk. First of all, this is the, the, the key argument we're given. We are told that the agreement, which supposedly will eliminate do away with all duties that exist between in trade between the US and Europe and most of the barriers that haven't got to do with duties and taxes and payments regulations differences between US and Europe it's going to generate we're told growth and a figure that's been quoted a lot in the report from the Center of Economic Policy Research this year I don't know whether you've got that figure here no, it's not here. Well, it's one of the most well-known think tanks as regards the uh, uh, economics in Europe. They talk about a growth, additional growth, thanks to TTIP, of 119 billion euros a year. 119 billion euros a year. Extra growth, additional growth per person, 545 euros per person in Europe, additional growth. This has been based on econometric uh, calculations, there are different models, there's one for the UK, different ways of calculating, but that's the figures, those are the figures. If we look at that figure, uh, 545 euros per head, well it looks like a lot of money, but uh, uh, at the end of the day we're talking, in, we're in Spain, the coffee is cheaper here, in the UK it's one more coffee per person per week, in Spain it would be two coffees more per person per week, well uh, it depends on what you think about it, two 50, 250 per person per week. That's what uh, the additional growth will mean. Uh, it's not exactly stimulating, is it? At least, uh, I don't think so. And uh, then it's also based on a very optimistic projection of the possibilities there are of breaking down the barriers, trade barriers between the US and Europe, because as I said before, the treaty is, I haven't said it, but the treaty is not, doesn't focus so much on duties and taxes, which are very low, low. they're about 2, 2, 3 percent on average. Uh, the treaty's focus is more on negotiations, are focusing especially on doing away with the non, other barriers, for instance, barriers that happen as a result of the differences in standards between the US and Europe. An example that we're given is that the You've got to put lights, um, winkers on cars and things like that in one position in Europe and in another position in the US. But then there's things like the chemical industry. Uh, standards are much more stringent in Europe than the US. Well, I would say there are technical differences in standards. Um, we're not just talking about winkers on cars. Uh, but there's a lot of politics. This is a political issue main, mainly when we're told that 50% of the non-duty barriers are going to be done away with because standards are going to converge. I think that is wishful thinking. That is simply not going to happen. Um, it's true that today these figures are not quoted so much. We are told more and more that SMEs are going to hugely benefit from this because there'll be less administrative red tape. Um, we are told that SMEs are going to be the greatest beneficiaries of the of doing away with these barriers.
but we should recognise that SMEs are the they they're the, not the companies that export most. It's larger companies that export more to the US. Eighty seven percent of the European SMEs don't export, but those who stand up for TTIP say that there are many barriers, but that's not going to affect most SMEs. I mean, we're talking about an additional expense of three four percent on average. So I mean, it's not just a, a valid argument. And uh, TTIP does not focus on SMEs. There's a small chapter for SMEs, but uh, they talk about the text proposed by the Commission t talks about creating a website for SMEs so that they can see what barriers are there and how to certify their products and create a council or committee that is going to uh, help uh, inform SMEs about priorities. Well, that really isn't very much, is it? That's the first argument. I criticise that argument. I, I don't believe that TTIP is going to generate huge amounts of money. I don't believe it. Second argument, that we hear more and more for the TTIP, it's more geopolitical in nature, uh, or systemic. We are told that TTIP is going to allow Europe and the US to continue leading uh, economic the economy in the world because it's going to allow the US and Europe to create a common standard that uh, stat or common standards, economic standards that are going to have to be complied with by exports uh, from uh, in third uh, uh, third countries, other countries, and other countries, emerging uh, economies, especially China, are going to thanks to the fact that there'll be a transatlantic market, they're going to have to adopt a common standard based on that market. And the motto seems to be that this is the last chance we have in Europe and US to, to do that because, you know, to, time is running out. We've got to do this. It's now or never. Uh, but as David said, uh, is it, uh, can we really tell, can we say that TTIP is going to allow Europe and the US to, to actually maintain their leadership? Because it's, from what we can see from negotiations, there's not going to be a harmonization, there's not going to be a, a common standard created, but there's such a huge amount of diversity in terms of standards that the most probable thing will be that, 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 that we, we will both acknowledge, Europe and the US bilaterally will acknowledge each other's standards. Those people that know about these technical aspects know that the single market in Europe is based on mutual acknowledgement of standards. It's a sort of a, a, a mutual recognition which benefits exports, which can also benefit uh, exports coming from third countries. But the TTIP, well, we're, what we see from the documents, and we don't know yet because it's still being negotiated, but it seems to be moving towards a bilateral acknowledgement. So only exporters in Europe and North America will be able to benefit, in fact, from that mutual acknowledgement. They will acknowledge each other's standards and then the, they will they will work on that basis, but it will be bilateral. So what's the incentive for third countries, for other countries? What's the incentive if there's going to be no harmonisation? So the geopolitical argument, in my opinion, just doesn't stand up. You know, is not uh, valid. In general, um, I don't know how much more time I have left. A minute. Well, in conclusion, if I had to summarise. As one of the speakers said this morning, people just go away with one thing. They take one home message home. If I had to summarise this, I would say, the TTIP, we're not going to gain much at all, and we're probably going to lose, because there's going to be a deregulating effect, and it's going to unsettle things. We can deal with this in the debate. Thank you. Before, thank you. Uh, Miguel, before we continue, those of you who have Twitter and are actively tweeting, there's a hashtag here called Eurodebate, Eurodebate, and you can put that on your tweets. Um, good. The TTIP, you say, is not the way forward. So what would be the way forward so that Europe remains a leader and remains and, and continues to influence global trade? You've spoken about exports from other countries. That's one, one of our big deficits. It's one of the big hypocrisies of the European Union. We talk about all these values and whatnot, but we have become a fortress. Um, what would be, in your opinion, the next step? Well, the next step, this morning we heard about investment. 
Juncker's plan, what have you. The problem in Europe, from my point of view, is not that we're a fortress. Europe is quite liberal, quite open, and recently we've gone much more for exports. The problem is that the only way uh, we support exports through external liberalisation seems to be the only way. And we know very well that products, that we compete at a high level, high, top level products. And we, as a European economy in general, we cannot compete with other economies that are low cost economies. But the trend is, uh, strategy is low cost, however. We're looking for new markets thanks to liberalisation instead of investing in developing new technologies and new top range products within the market of Europe. So the TTIP for me is just a thing to sort of distract people's attention from the real problems and real solutions which entail the, the, the reform and what is called e economic upgrading in English. We've got to invest in the development of top quality products. Yeah, you've mentioned low cost and low grade products, but there are a series of low grade products that have also had to do with the development of community policies. Uh, agriculture, jean Lee is gonna tell us about the repercussions of the crisis in the in agriculture and the other industry which is tremendously important which is energy power well thank you very much first of all i have to apologize because you're going to have to put up with my french accent but if i speak in english i tell you it would be much worse um my business is to do make macroeconomics but i'm going to talk about what we call sectorial aspects um, what I want to show you basically is that policy, European policies, well-intentioned European policies, where the Union shows to be innovative, um, provides new guidance, might have undesired effects and sometimes the opposite effects to what is uh, the aim. I don't want you to conclude that it would therefore be better to do nothing. I'm not saying that. But first of all, because in Europe there is a tremendous ability to innovate. One of the examples is the environmental policy. It's obvious that Europe is, is a leader in that area. And although some of these policies, some of the aspects of the po environmental policy in Europe have negative consequences. I, however, think that they're more or less in the right direction and should continue to be go in that direction. Some of them are negative simply because one of the reasons is because other countries don't follow suit. But that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't carry on with what we're doing. Now, the second reason to be proactive and be in, innovative, yeah, the second reason is, uh, and this is very clear in the case of uh, the agricultural policy, is the fact that uh, if there is less interventionism, that would not mean less impact. It would mean that impact would be different. And I'm going to tell you what I mean in the case of the uh, agricultural policy. <clears throat> I'm going to start with the case of um, energy power policy. One of the most recent movements uh, or initiatives of the Union in this area is what's called the Third Energy Package, and uh, that includes elements uh, against monopolies, energy monopolies. And especially there are regulations or provisions that are aiming at preventing a situation where primary energy gas, for instance, producers are also owners of the infrastructures of transmission of that energy. I'm sure you have in mind what I'm talking about and who the bureaucrats in Europe are thinking about those who designed this policy. They That was not liked at all by Russia, of course, and Gazprom, they didn't like it at all, because obviously Gazprom wanted to control the transmission of gas to Europe through the North Stream and South Stream projects. One of the immediate consequences of these new rules has been well, ha has been that there's been pressure of the European Union on Bulgaria to stop work that, w w w that was, had already started to build the South Stream. The reaction from Russia has also been so to say, well, if you don't want 
uh, us to own the infrastructure of transmission since we don't want to continue to give you the gas through the Ukraine. You are going to get the gas in Turkey and then you do what you can and what you must to take it to the European countries. We are going to leave you the gas in Turkey and that's the, the end of it. Now, that clearly has very many undesired and uh, unplanned uh, effects and consequences, difficulties in certain countries, especially in the south of Europe, that depend on gas. Italy, for instance. The case of Bulgarians. I mean, they hadn't done anything, and all of a sudden they've got to stop all this work because there's a change of policy in Brussels. And another consequence will be it hasn't really helped political relations between Europe and Russia. Um, now a few words on um, environmental policy in Europe. It is clear that Europe has been more aggressive, much more ag aggressive, active, proactive, more ambitious than uh, I would say all the other countries in the world. One of the consequences of uh, that, of imposing rules of the game, environmental rules, harder, stricter environmental rules, has been to incentivate delocalization of certain activities. In other words, some industries have gone elsewhere. I'm thinking about, for instance, petroleum refiner uh, refineries. I don't know what the situation in Spain, but in France, is going to disappear. They're just going elsewhere. I'm not just saying that it's because of the environmental rules. There are many other reasons, but basically they are taking their business elsewhere. And that has is one of the reasons for these people to take business, their business to places where environmental laws are not so strict. But that same uh, incentive or that same reason, unfortunate reason, for delocalization uh, has been seen in many other industries, not just the power industry. Of course, that has a, 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 an immediate uh, consequence in terms of jobs. People are left jobless. That's the first thing that happens. But even if we go beyond environmental impact, refineries, for instance, the refineries moved from, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Spain or France to... Uh, to some uh, Qatar or somewhere. Now, do you believe that the impact, environmental impact of that refinery over there in Qatar is lower than it is here, the global effect? I mean, we're all living on the same planet. Uh, do you think that they're going to do less harm because they're in Qatar instead of Dunkirk or China? Uh, is the impact going... No, of course not. The impact globally... It's going to be the same. So, the good intention is it's it's a good intention, but it has not really had. It's not really as positive as might uh, want as might be expectable. I'm not saying we shouldn't have done it. We then afterwards have to convince people in Qatar, China, and what have you, to also be strict as regards their environmental laws. But since I come from Crédit Agricole, I've got to talk about agricultural policy and uh, about what is known as the, the, the Common Agricultural Policy, CAP. This policy has been heavily criticised in the past, especially by, because or for the biases introduced into the international trade of agricultural products, even... But because of the negative effects, it was, it, 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 or how it affected poor countries, which, on the other hand, were helped through the fund, uh, the European Fund for Development. I'm thinking about certain African countries. Why? Or it was said it was a policy that focused on helping production, aiding production. There was a, a couplage, a coupling, an association between subsidies that were received by the producer in Europe and the amount that was produced. Of course, as a result, that cut off the relation between production and market prices. And also it was an incentive to export those surpluses from Europe at low prices and make poor countries make their life more difficult. 
because often in those countries the only way to survive was agriculture. And also there was a lot of pressure from the US and other countries and that ended at Doha when uh, we had to introduce adjustments very strongly in the CAP. And, um, and the adjustments uh, or the elements that were thought to be more negative were done away with. But there are still negative uh, aspects because... CAP, the, 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 the economic, European economic policy, let's imagine a situation where we, the, 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 there were no policy for agriculture in Europe. What would our, the situation of our agriculture in Europe be? We'd probably have a sector of production of cereals, uh, very stronger, stronger production of cereals. We would uh, probably have agricultural companies much more concentrated much larger companies we would have would have some sectors which would not be too affected for instance wine production which it does not come under the cap would i don't know what the situation is with the uh, olive oil the olive oil industry whether they get uh, support or not and we would have sectors that would have disappeared completely in a few years, I'm thinking about, for instance, the production of meat, uh, beef, uh, uh, and uh, sheep's meat. It wouldn't last for 10 years. We wouldn't have cows. in there would, there would be no more cows in Europe. We would be eating Argentinian beef, Australian beef, or whatever. We would not have meat production in Europe. Um, the impact on... Uh, the rest of the world of this absence of this theoretical or hypothetical absence of a CAP would not would also be present. There would also be an impact on the rest of the world, for instance, through a higher production of cereals in Europe, because we would have an increased efficiency, we would have more concentration of production in smaller, there'd be less companies, uh, we would be evolving towards an agriculture which would have been similar to that of the US where uh, in fact what happens is that direct support of agricultural uh, of farms is is, is uh, much uh, greater than in Europe the total budget for support in the US is more or less uh, 100 billion dollars but 80 of those billion are for what we call food bonds so there's only 20 million left for direct support to producers, mainly through market mechanisms, for instance, subsidies to insure, uh, private insurance, uh, private insurance schemes, etc. If we suppress the CAP, we would have something like that. I have uh, spent three years in Mexico at the beginning of the century. <laughs> of the millennium, and I assure you that the opening up of the North American market to farm products, even without a major subsidy to the cereal sector, has uh, definitely affected the cereals uh, sector in, in Mexico. So corn, for instance, has seen the arrival of huge amounts of corn at much more affordable prices. So the alternative, I mean, we could, we could do things better. Of course we could, when we think about agricultural policy, of course we could. But the solution, of course, is not to say, this is a bad policy, we have to forego this policy. That's not a solution. And let me, let me make a reference to a fourth item, which is important when we think about the impact of European policies on the rest of the world. And I'm back to the economy. It's quantitative easing. The quantitative easing that we're going to be seeing in Europe in uh, the coming few years. I have not gone into the details of its impact, but I am going to refer to how it affected some countries in Latin America. The quantitative easing in the States, I imagine that the impact on maybe Poland, countries that are close 
and that are not in the eurozone we think about that quantitative easing of the european central bank that's going to be a major impact one of the consequences is going to be that all of this additional money is not going to stay in europe for investment purposes part of it is going to go to pay for the acquisition of assets in other countries in other parts of the world and we've seen for instance one of the consequences which has been the very important revaluation of um, Latin American currencies after the Fed's quantitative easing. And that wasn't the only uh, reason. I mean, there was excitement regarding forecasts for growth, prices affecting raw materials. Brazil was going to be growing at a 7% rate every year, and that's why we had to buy reales. But also the availability of uh, liquidity on the markets. That also has fed into the appreciation of Latin American currencies. I don't know what will happen, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis the Central Bank of Poland. We have uh, Polish friends among us today, but I believe that definitely we're going to be seeing more pressure borne upon us in the upcoming few months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very interesting also. It was um, interesting to see that specific assessment. Definitely, of course, our agricultural policy is always very much on the top of our minds. So my question would be, where should we go in terms of a solution? What I mean is we're looking at the analysis, we're looking at the possible effects of quantitative easing in Europe vis-a-vis -vis the States, but we don't do the same vis-a-vis -vis Japan. It's been very different how it's affected the economy. And I would like to ask maybe we can we can talk about this at the end i'd like to talk a little bit about the environment and let me talk as we did before about agenda 2020 in fact europe is the group of countries in the world which can be defined as being most ambitious and that's been reassessed with 2030 i'd like to know what the effects are going to be do you think of this period which we believe is going to be mid to long term of much cheaper oil prices because it is more affordable and there's other issues we're back to poland now the fact that some countries uh, are not looking at that because they have coal as uh, an essential uh, energy source in some countries uh, mix so just bullet points please well yes and i'm a macroeconomist so i don't have very specific very precise uh, responses. If we talk about the impact of the lower prices of oil, the last question you pose, when we address the issue of environmental incentives, my answer is going to be very brief. I don't believe that we're going to be seeing oil at $45 a barrel for a long time, maybe a year, maybe two years. But frankly, I don't think it's going to be long lasting because there is going to be a correction on the supply side. So when we, let's see, at this point, for instance, we are internally, we are making midterm economic forecasts. So we're looking at 2020. And this is just to see whether our model is, uh, is valid. Well, our working hypothesis is a hundred dollar barrel. That's what we're looking at. Well, it could be, I think it, that it could be that the current situation is actually the result of uh, a very special type of geopolitics. I think that there were economic changes in the sector itself, which were very, very significant in the states you have shale gas and shale oil in the states but there are limits there there are physical limits and i don't think that we're going to be able to reproduce those realities in other parts of the world so at the end of the day the hypothesis is of a barrel that returns to a price which is not that harmful quote unquote 
to the environment. As to the reforms of the common agricultural policy, well, I have even less to say. I know what's being considered. I know that there are conversations underway regarding the possibility of having the common agricultural policy target something that would be more similar to the farm bill in place in the USA. Having insurance mechanisms which could perhaps avoid those increases, peaks and troughs in the uh, income levels of the producers. But there's resistance. There's resistance to that for good reasons, I believe. And the main advantage is that it would all be much cheaper for the European financial system, but there are drawbacks. So the objective of the CAP is not only to produce, there's also another environmental objective, which is contained in the, in the cap. What is sought is to, you're going to think I'm a poet, we want to defend the European landscapes because an immediate consequence would be that farming in the mountains is going to disappear if the cap were to disappear. So, also, there's another objective which is social in nature. So, it's not having in those fields where there's less of an income and if you compare with city centers often enough we don't want the income disappearing for many of the farm workers people who live out in the country let's talk in numbers now between 80 and 100 percent of the of the net income of of beef producers is the result of European subsidies, which means that the sales cover just barely, barely production costs. And there's nothing left for the producer. So I think that yes, reforms are possible and we've We've proven that because the cap has been reformed in the past. We have taken the rest of the world more into account, of course, but I believe that that's going to be very slow doing. And I'm not saying this because I'm a Frenchman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's return to the macro universe and let's see how all of these measures are affecting the Eurozone, of course, but how they are perceived by the United States and by China. Miguel, please. Thank you, Christina, and thank you to the Carlos Damberis Foundation for organizing this event. I'm going to be a bit of a daredevil here, and I'm going to, in 10 minutes, address four minor issues. One is governance of the global system, the financial system. The second is Mario Draghi's quantitative easing policy. Third, the lack of global demand, and fourth, secular stagnation. So I have two and a half minutes for each one of these headlines. I'm going to be very focused, and I'm going to look at David and the financial system and the comparison between the financial and the trade systems. The difference between, between these systems is that historically in the financial, there really never was uh, authentic unilateralism. In the financial system, what we've seen is that the more powerful country decided what the lines of action were going to be for the financial system. This happened in times of the British Empire, and this has happened in the years between the two world wars and after World War II, when the United States was, in principle, at the head of the game. We know that we've heard that this is the post-hegemonic world, and we know that we say that we have global institutions that can live without a hegemon, without a global leader, but we see that this often enough leads to greater degrees of instability. What the U.S. has done over the past 30 years is establish a set of rules which have been followed by many countries. And if we look at this, we see that the US is the rule maker and Europe is the rule shaper, modeling those rules, and the rest of the world are the rule takers, those who abide by those rules. 
So the rules that have been supported by the U.S. over the past 30 years were basically three. The first was to open up the capital accounts, in other words, open up the capital markets. Secondly, allow monies to float and flow freely. And third, have central banks be independent. We as Europeans have been more popish than the Pope, and we have uh, become involved in what Carlos defines as dogmas in a dogmatic framework, whereby we have abided by those dogma, free circulation of capital, of course, this is one of the essential principles of the Union. Secondly, we're going to have the Euro float, and we're not going to ever do anything about it. In 2000, when it was very weak, and that's when the European Central Bank did something, but it didn't do anything when the Euro appreciated by practically 90% from 2002 until 2008. And we have the central bank, which is most independent of all in banks, central banks in the world, so much so that it cannot monetize a debt, which historically central banks could do. This is uh, contained in Maastricht. What we saw is that when the crisis hit us, many of the players didn't really play the game according to the rules established by the states. China, as of always, continues to think and breathe Bretton Woods. It has control of capitalists. It doesn't allow the yuan to float. And the central bank, of course, is not independent. And we've seen also that during the crisis, Japan began to tweak the system. The Southeast Asia began to intervene. Korea began to introduce capital controls. Brazil also. And even Switzerland, usually perceived as uh, the star student, began to anchor its currency to the euro. So in those global adjustments, who pays for the crisis, we as Europeans, because we wanted to abide by the rules of the game, had to live with a euro that was at 140 throughout the entirety of the crisis. So that was Trichet. And then came Mario Draghi. I think that Draghi, and some already said, Xavier and Guillermo, said that we should erect statues and, and we should really applaud him and congratulate him because he's done wonderful things. But I think that he does understand the international elements of finance and money. So he has seen that there is no escape valve. The European Union and ourselves have to do something to change this. Draghi's quantitative easing, as Jean-Louis said, is not really going to solve uh, the issue. In other words, we're not going to be achieving more, more credit for the system, because as we heard today, the system in place in Europe is um, bank-based and not capital-based. So as Draghi said, the effects of quantitative easing are actually carried out by the exchange rate which is really um, becoming a party to the war of currencies, will we begin to see collateral damage. Switzerland has been harmed. Denmark is suffering because it is pegged to the euro, and they're suffering a lot. And now they have uh, issues, and Poland and others probably will follow suit because capital is going to leave the eurozone, and when the capital leaves the eurozone, the rate of exchange drops, and this is why normally the Eurozone has to export more. But the thing is, as Guillermo rightly pointed out, we have, we have uh, an excess. We have uh, a surplus. We're going to have not two, but maybe four percent. So somebody has got to buy all of these products. And China, we can all say that China is changing the model. Well, I think that if we look at the Chinese economy, we know that this is not going to be happening anytime soon. China has its model, and it has a 7,000 per capita at this point in time. So China is in no position to really be um, the one who is going to push forward the Chinese or the global economy. So it's going to be as always. It's going to be the U.S. It's going to have to be the engine for consumption. America is going to be consuming. Well, the U.S. 
is increasingly less important in the global economy. So it's going to be very difficult to have the U.S. be the engine pulling Europe. And then there's Germany. What do we do with Germany? Can Germany change her model? Can Germany have more internal consumption? I think it's very difficult. I think the Germans know that they're going to have surpluses and this is going to affect us in thinking about how we solve the internal issues. I think that Germans increasingly, enlightened Germans, the elites, the Germans who know the population, who are familiar with the issue, well, they know that if you don't want to change your economic model and if you're going to continue to have surpluses, you have got to go down the transfers route because you have to do something with your surplus and give it to those who have a deficit so that they continue to consume your products. The problem, of course, is how you explain this to your German population. But I don't think there's any other way to, um, to solve it. If Germany wants to continue to export with a surplus systematically in place, it logically calls for some kind of a transfer activity in the Eurozone. And this leads me to secular stagnation, which is the macro issue uh, par excellence. What we've seen is that over the past 30 years, and as we said this morning, this is debt-based growth. As to credit, in the States, we had that engine overcoming two bubbles, the dot-com bubble, which burst, and then the real estate bubble, which was credit-based and which was based on very low rates. Again, there, that bubble burst, and now it's been five or six years with a monetary policy that is ultra expansive. Historically, this is a first ever. And we continue to see growth that is much, much less than growth when other recessions were successfully overcome. So this is the quantitative easing, lower bound, everybody pumping pills and even so, we grow no more than 2 or 3%, which is much less than we ever grew before. So Larry Summers, for instance, says we have got a problem. What do we do? What do we do? And there's three alternatives. First, we ignore the problem. We do nothing. As Guillermo says, we muddle through. Uh, we uh, say, well, this is uh, what there is, and there's nothing we can do about this, so let's just... Or we can be more like Hayek, we can be Austrians, and we can say, okay, let's let everything tumble down. Well, fortunately, during the crisis, there were some brilliant minds that said the banking system needs to be saved, because if not, we're going to fall into a depression, like in the 30s, we've you know, come over that. We're going to use our monetary policy, again, pumping steroids, again, see whether this stimulus can actually have us flip the paradigm. The Americans have been doing this for a couple of years. We started in March, but as Draghi said, I think that, again, here we need other elements and we need those structural reforms, especially for products. It's very, very important. And uh, when we think about bureaucracy and paperwork and, and, and cutting down the red tape, somebody very close to me just very recently wanted to set up a company in Spain and said it's pretty well impossible, so expensive. So they said, okay, I'm going to London. So they're headquartered in London and they pay taxes in London, but they live in Madrid. They don't do it here in Madrid, which I think shows you the kind of problems we have here at home. But, but I think that there is another option, which is to take a look and see what the possibilities are. And if at this point in time, markets tell us, please, please spend your money because I am ready to pay Germany to buy Germany's debt. I mean, right now, Germany is issuing debt, which is negative, which costs money. It costs money to have a bond, a German bond. Spain, as we said, buys money at better rates than the US. We have an investment problem, which is huge. Over the past few years, we've seen a plummeting of investments in Europe to the tune of 15%. Well, I think that we should think that now is the time to invest because markets are telling us, please invest, ladies and gentlemen. Not only from the public uh, side of the equation, the private too. This is, I believe, the only way 
the because apart from it's being essential if we want to overcome the prices if we want future generations to have access to the technology the innovation the welfare that we seek well also because it's profitable there's money in it i mean if you have if you have access to such affordable rates it's going to be definitely zero cost if not positive so i think that that is the route that we should be looking at thank you it's scary isn't it what a landscape if we don't uh, think about those possible investment scenarios so you you back the juncker plan that public private partnership you think do you that this is going to actually happen or do you think it's just going to be cosmetic i think that i think that we're leaving the dogmas behind we're still strapped down so this is difficult this is difficult i think that the the, the junkers plan is sort of putting your foot in the door so that people in brussels berlin frankfurt and elsewhere understand that as as we heard from the uh, expert from the italian embassy when we talk about the discourse and so on will we begin to see why we talk more about growth and investment than we did two years ago i think it's not enough i think that more investment is needed i think more fresh money is needed so we're going to see whether this is this is something that spurs private investment because there is profit to be made and public monies public monies should think about the framework and the projects but perhaps perhaps more investments are going to be called for just recently i was in uh, a seminar where there were keynesians and uh, defenders of hayek or the austrian school so the austrians said more investments are not going to stimulate anything and the keynesians upheld that no markets are asking for more investment so the idea it wasn't really a debate it was more of a a fruitful conversation it was really trying to understand the psychological framework i mean if people think if people think along the austrian lines more public debt is going to result in more taxes in the future no one's going to spend because the idea is going to be well this is bad and i don't like this if people understand that more public investment can result in more productivity and more stimulus and more work and more of everything it's going to represent more growth so we're going to be able to pay off the debt well then you have a framework a psychological framework which allows you to think that this is going to be successful so i think that we're stuck there in that debate we're saying this is good this is bad this can be done this cannot be done so as somebody said before maybe we should be experimenting a little bit more and i i i think uh, uh miguel has made some very um, buenos puntos pero para mí un cosa que es muy but there's something for me which is very important in Europe, which is deciding. We have a limited amount of time for an agreement. A quantitative easing a year ago was much more important. We have a central bank which is independent. So act as an independent central bank. Take your decisions and remember uh, that it we should be able to decide quickly in the states decisions are taken quickly in europe slowly the uh, common agricultural policy is definitely complex yes but the fact of the matter today is that half nearly half of the budget of the european budget investments and so on in a sector which cannot create any jobs so we need to reform that and we need to do it quickly Let's think about the Juncker package, the 300, I don't know how many billion. We need to decide. It is important. It's pressing. I think that this is not being addressed in, in European debates. Guillermo says, and I couldn't agree more with him, we are in the midst of a crisis. 
you know, we talk and talk and talk, but what we need to do is take decisions and quickly. That's my opinion. We have a question over there. We're too slow. Muchas gracias, Jochen Müller. Thank you very much. From the European Commission here in Spain, I have two comments and a question. For Miguel Otero, I agree. The Juncker plan is putting your foot in the door, but it's a beginning. It's a beginning. I think that we want for people to snap and say more investments. Well, I wish with, with private money, which is, I think, where uh, basically the investments should be coming from. And I would like to comment on Gabriel's uh, contributions. He believes that we need to stress innovation, research, and so on. We need to focus on that. And why are we wasting our time with uh, the TTIP? Well, I think that we could tackle both simultaneously. It's not only the Juncker plan, it's also Horizon 2020, which involves 80 billion euros for R&D purposes. We have Cosme for SMEs, that's 3 billion, which are being poured into uh, financial instruments, which are going to have a lever effect. And the TTIP can also be uh, achieved because it looks at growing in industries in cutting edge technology where the where the value added element really is. Let me give you some examples because this is the sector where workers are more qualified and where mm, wages are good. For instance, the automotive sector. The agreement signed with South Korea in the past uh, two years, well, we've seen sales grow by 24% in Europe. Spain is the second producer of uh, automobiles in the, Euro the European Union. I think there are 17 factories. Biochemistry, again, another very important sector. Energy efficiency, as mentioned by uh, our French colleague, Mr. Martin, when he talked about renewables. This tells us that if we crack the North American market, we're going to export more. And not only to North America, but other parts of the world also, because growth growth in the coming years will not be coming from Spain. 90% of global growth is outside of Europe. And this also is an issue which has to do with SMEs, because of course SMEs are major corporations, but there's a lot of SMEs involved in sourcing those major companies. And there's also processed farm goods, textiles, footwear, where we see tariffs that are of up to 30% or more. And if we tear down these tariffs, that's going to be very, very advantageous for many SMEs in Spain. Multilateralism, I agree with David when he says it is the best possible approach, but the fact of the matter is that unfortunately it's come to a standstill. So we have two options. Either we cross our arms and say, well, same as always, or we can do something. And I think that's what we're doing. Thanks to the agreement signed with Singapore, Japan, Canada, South Korea, and yes, with the US. Why not? And I hope, I hope that when that agreement is signed, we can unblock the um, the multilateralism in uh, WTO. And now my question. The question is for David Wright. I don't know whether I understood you. At the beginning, you said that you're against the TTIP because it's not multilateral, because it is bilateral. And then... Afterwards, when you talked about global finance, you said that we have two options. Either we have an international treaty where everyone agrees, but this is unlikely, not very likely, or we could go down the bilateral route and build up, build up a multilateralism. I thought that's what we were doing with TTIP. I have not well, thank you very much. Are there no more questions? I'm g and then you answer all, all the questions together. Thank you. Um, we are talking about products, but I think we should also talk about services. And um, that's been mentioned by the Credit Agricole um, representative. He said that in environmental policy, we have a series of standards in Europe that are not respected in other countries, and that has a cost, that carries a cost. 
Um, uh, I think that the criticism of the TTIP is not really... I, I find it funny because a lot of other things are going to be covered. On the 1st of January 2016 in Europe, as regards services, we, the insurance companies are going to be subject to stricter standards and that's going to uh, affect the whole industry. If in the insurance companies we have to integrate all risks based on the new calculations of the European Directive that we have, those of us who have branches in other countries outside the European Union will be creating a different structure from the concept that will not be similar, that, that they won't have in the US or other countries, and that would distort the whole picture. And probably it's not an exactly exact economic policy measure, but a community measure that affects the international dimension of, of European uh, companies. Thank you. Um, let's start, David, then Jean-Louis, and then uh, the other members of the panel. Uh, as I understand the, uh, the question about uh, finance and the financial institutions, uh, of the future. I think there's a lot we can do right now which would make things a lot better. Mm? Uh, I won't go into all the details, but it means much more ex-ante cooperation, uh, much more uh, coordination upstream of rulemaking, dispute settlement. There's all, and this can be informal, but if you like, much more binding. Um, the United States and the European Union, their share of global capital markets today will be lower tomorrow. Uh, that's obvious because the other markets are growing. So um, actually both the Europeans and the Americans have a huge interest in cooperating and building the financial institutions uh, of the future right now. Hmm? Right now. Because tomorrow their influence and in future their influence will be a lot less. Sometimes people don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. Uh, and if, uh, uh, let us say, uh, one of those two countries uh, doesn't apply the rules properly, um, whether it's the Basel standards or whatever, uh, do we think that China and Brazil and India don't notice that? Of course they notice that. Of course they do. Um, and in my view, uh, the right approach here is to cooperate more on rulemaking, uh, formalize it as much as possible, uh, and build institutions uh, which, uh, and that's the difficult bit, that's the really difficult bit, institutions with binding powers and some form of penalty system. What's the penalties uh, if countries don't apply the financial rules? That's extremely difficult. But it needs academics, um, which Miguel and others, to advise us here. But let's not hide away and think we don't have a problem. We've got a big problem. And, and when Miguel talked about, uh, you know, the U.S. was the standard shaper or standard uh, maker uh, up until 2000, I think that was probably right hmm, in financial markets. No longer true uh, since Europe has started to integrate its capital markets, and I was very involved in that. Um, and certainly one of the problems was we didn't have any standards on subprime, did we? Mm? Uh, you can argue about what caused this crisis, but I would say subprime was right at the heart of it. And the world has lost 15% of GDP. 15% of GDP as a result of bad standardization or non-standardization at all of highly risky lending. Uh, we had banking regulators who left us with a system of less than 1%, about 1% callable capital, and leverage of 80 in some banks. Uh, I don't think you have to be a genius to work out that if property prices started to move, you were in big trouble. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so, uh, you know, that is simply not good enough, is it? Hmm? Uh, simply not good enough. Uh, and, and we've made progress. There's no doubt we've made progress. Uh, but in my view, and I've talked a lot about this, it's not sufficient. We have to go further. Bueno, um, no voy I'm not going to answer exactly the question because I don't really know 
the the insurance industry. Uh, but something interesting in what you've said is the interest, the importance of the services sector. It is now accounts now for 70, some cases 80 percent of the GDP of European countries. The same proportion in terms of employment and the biggest, I think, source uh, of future jobs in Europe, the services sector. And it has an, uh, an advantage. Services are often consumed where they are produced. And that means that if there is an offer, <coughs> a greater uh, offer of services, we're going to we're going to develop them here in Europe. We're not going to import them. How do we incentivate this? Well, I think that we should act on the on the side of the offer and on the side of supply. When we talk about offer, it's been mentioned here with several specific examples that there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of taxes, and I think that that is especially strong in the case of small companies that cannot. Services, which are often services companies, large companies like, I don't know, industrial, big indus, industrial companies, Credit Agricole, and also banks don't pay the rate of, uh, the official rate of, of taxes. We've always got, you know, we've always found ways to pay less. And SME is not, they're caught. I mean, you're caught in it. You've got small garage, you're a hairdresser, you're a... Uh, translator or whatever and you've got to pay the full whack and there's no way you can't get away from it and you've got to put up with a red tape that we also uh, deal with better because we have resources so a lot has to be done on that side on the side of supply uh, it's all very well to offer services but if people haven't got money they're not going to buy anything services or anything else uh, and that's not going to create jobs so um, I think Miguel mentioned the psychological aspect of all this. I think at this time in Europe, we have we, we, people have just become convinced that we're in, you know, we're in a hole. We're not going to get out of it. We're not going to grow, and it's all our fault. And that we're not it's just we just cannot get out of it. And this issue, this damn, let me use the word, issue of structural reform. They keep on about structural reform, but what is the specific outcome? The, the outcome is that people in the street, even myself, say, when these structural reforms come along, what's going to happen? Am I going to lose my job when that happens? So what am I going to do? I'm not going to consume. I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to spend my money because I won't have any money in my pocket. So we've got to, we've got to do something about this pessimism in Europe at this time. People are depressed, and that's worse than bureaucracy even. Gabriel, what can you say? Well, thank you very much for the comments and the questions. They, this gives me an opportunity to answer in greater detail. My response to the Commission would be to say, well, the gain that we're being told about, official models of the Commission are telling us that, that we stand to, the gain that we're being told about is really very small and that, that and we're not being told that the TTIP is going to have uh, negative effects, greater inequality, because there will be a change in the structure of the economy. And we know, well, workers in non-competitive industries are not going to simply transition seamlessly into higher competitive industries. That is a tough process that has to be supported. And as we know, in Europe, uh, the means we have to support workers that are transitioning from one industry to another are very scarce. We've got the European Globalization Fund with very few, not a lot of money at all. Certain member states are very good at, at transitions. Denmark, for instance, is always quoted as a model. But Spain uh, has had more difficulties. I mean, people can't just transition easily. And then there's another aspect that's being criticised by people on the street. Maybe it's an exaggeration, but there is a risk of having a deregulation effect. That is, standards to go down, to be lowered. If you look at the standards, for instance, you've spoken about biochemistry. Right. In the US, there is still a regulation, a rule of chemical products 
that dates from the 1970s and it doesn't distinguish between hazardous and non-hazardous materials but new chemical products and old chemical products which are not controlled or are controlled depending on that whereas in Europe we have the rich regulation which is much more strict it's not what it's one of the strictest in the world but any convergence between those two systems I would say would go would 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 lower the standards uh, and I don't think that the rich system should be done away with but I mean the differences are so great in some areas that it's just not going to happen you know there's, the, 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 the standards are going to drop are going to fall and um, what I would say is that you know um, the models we're told about infinitesimal gains worthless gains Exports are not just uh, given support by eliminating duties on exports. You support them by giving them investment. You support them by developing policies of investment that help them to grow. And they talk about competitive competitiveness in Europe, which is based on high-grade products that don't compete on the basis of price. They compete on the basis of quality. And if you reduce the barriers by 2-3%, that's nothing. Uh, and there's also going to be a, a risk of inequality and deregulation and dropping standards. So the whole picture to me is not good. Of course, this is all debatable, but that's my opinion. And it's also been mentioned, you've spoken about SMEs. Of course, there are SMEs that export. The car industry is often quoted because it's less polit po politicised or politicised there are many SMEs in the car industry especially in Germany but in Germany the association of SMEs has has been very critical of the agreement is against the, the TTIP because they say that the, the agreement is going to benefit big companies the big boys and they quote the arbitration mechanisms between states and investors they say that it's going to benefit big companies because the small companies don't usually invest abroad and they cannot allow themselves the luxury of paying for legal proceedings. Uh, so that is going to benefit the large companies. So SMEs don't stand to gain very much, I don't think. And then we spoke about services. You've spoken about services. Please, could, could you finish? Yes. The, the important services are important, but there's a problem with services. And it, it is what we, uh, is the bound hall uh, disease. It's difficult to increase productivity in the sector of services. If you are making a coffee in a coffee shop, you can only be more produ productive to a certain level. You can't produce more than X number of coffee coffees per minute. It just cannot be done. Whereas with automation and other processes in, for instance, the production of goods, it's easier to increase productivity. So services is important, but we should not forget that it's more difficult to increase productivity in services. And how, uh, the internet, yeah, how, ma how many jobs does that create? Yeah, Miguel, I just want to make a comment on the internet and the TTIP. I think one of the things where we would need more competence, more skill, and if we don't create it inside, we'll have to create it exogenously, so to speak, is greater competi uh, competence in telecommunications, the internet, broadband uh, access, you know, for the internet to actually work properly, and Europe can learn a lot from the US in that respect. To finish, I'm going to be a bit positive, upbeat, as regards what we were saying about pessimism. In uh, you know, we're in a state of depression in Europe in more ways than one. Um, we self-flagellate. Um, I I was talking about this the other day. What's happening in Greece? You know, we've got to realise where we come from and where we are, who we are. I mean, a party from a communist inspired company, uh, a political party, is governing Greece and there's been no disturbances in the streets, there's been no manipulation of the uh, ballot box process, the colonels haven't done anything, that would have been very, very, very unlikely 20 years ago even. So I think the, the, the discontent has been channeled properly and well through democratic channels. Uh, Ramfakis was sitting down with Cybles yesterday and negotiating in a civilised manner. And they weren't, you know. I think we have we we we've we've adv we've made a, a lot of progress in that respect. You know, our democracy is more resilient than we than uh, 
We were with Barry Eichenbing the other day. He's the most important economist historian today, great knowledge of Europe, and he said that what that 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 there was no he would he was surprised to see that there was not more more social violence and discontent in Europe. So we're doing things better than 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 what we would think. You know, we are resilient. We are showing an ability to resist and to do things without punching each other in the face. And um, what was being said by David and making quick and rapid and fast decisions? Well, there's 28 countries, you know, 19 euro countries. Each one has its own position. If we want to be more quicker and faster and more effect effective, we've got to do something politically. And sometimes the public discourse tells us, well, the political union is what we need and what the euro needs, but it's impossible because Europe, the peoples of Europe don't want it. And I'm beginning a campaign to tell people, anybody who says that, I will say, right, you give me evidence to support what you're saying because the Eurobarometer, depending on how you ask people a question, the majority of Europeans feel European. They also feel whatever they are, British or Spanish or whatever, but they also feel European. And when you ask them whether they want more integration in terms of the economy, most of them say yes. Most of the people are in favour of the euro, in spite of the crisis, in Greece even, and in Germany. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's a mental attitude sometimes of saying a great inter political integration in Europe is not possible, therefore we've got to look for solutions that are technocratic without asking people this technocratic federalism that is being implanted. And um, I think we, there should be more debate, more discussion, whether people actually want this or not, and what people actually want. And we would probably discover that more people want European Union, political union, and not going back to the old currencies than we thought. Well, thank you for that upbeat, optimistic note. Thank you to the Foundation. And then see you the next time. Thank you.